I am Ben Chandler, and I am the CEO of the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky. And we're very proud, again, to partner with Interact for Health to present the 2019 Data Forum. Uh, since its inception, the Data Forum has been focused on showcasing effective uses of health data in the Kentucky, Ohio region and generating excitement about regional innovation and open data efforts Highlight and highlighting national perspectives on open data efforts and innovation. Today's agenda brings to you health leaders from our region who are collecting, using, examining, and critically thinking about data and health. This examination is also central to the work that we do at the Foundation. The Foundation's mission is to address the unmet health needs of Kentuckians by doing uh, several things, including developing and influencing policy, improving access to care, reducing health risks and disparities, and promoting health equity. I want to tell you a little bit uh, before we start about, very little bit, about our current work at the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky. Uh, we're focusing our efforts uh, really in a major way on policy advocacy. Uh, the reason we're doing that is uh, we understand, as important as all of the other efforts are, somebody needs to really bring everything together and lead in the effort for good health policy. And we're trying to do that, and as you all know, it's not easy. Not easy to get uh, our legislatures and our city councils and our county fiscal courts and other policymakers to, uh, to put policies in that really, really do lead to better health for our people. And one of the areas that we're particularly involved in is our effort to reduce tobacco use. Uh, we have to reduce smoking and secondhand smoke exposure in Kentucky if we want to improve the health of our state. Uh, in Kentucky, and you all, those of you who are from Ohio, may or may not know this, but Kentucky leads the entire country in cancer, in both incidence of cancer and mortality. Cancer mortality is a result of cancer. Uh, I think you can appreciate that it's a spot that we don't want to be in. Uh, in addition to that, the annual tobacco use cost to Kentucky is $1.9 billion in health care expenditures and $2.8 billion in smoking-related productivity losses. Uh, so, in furtherance of this effort, we have launched a coalition called the Coalition for a smoke-free tomorrow. Uh, the coalition is committed to reducing smoking rates, and by the way, we also happen to vie every year with West Virginia to see who has the highest smoking rate in the country. Uh, we're committing to, committed to reducing those smoking rates and the exposure to secondhand smoke in the Commonwealth. Uh, of course, now we have the relatively new problem of the use of e-cigarettes by adolescents and teens, which we've heard so much about in the media of late. Uh, so because of this added problem of heavy, heavy use of e-cigarettes and the nicotine that they contain and the fact that we're essentially addicting an entire new generation of Americans, uh, we're going to be working on three legislative priorities in the 2020 session. Uh, the first one is taxing e-cigarettes, and we'd like to, they, they don't, they're not subject to any state excise tax at all, unlike other tobacco products. In fact, they're the only tobacco product that's not subject to excise tax, and we hope to get that tax raised uh, to a level that's commensurate with the, the uh, tax on uh, regular tobacco products. We also are going to be pushing to re raise the legal age to buy tobacco from 18 to 21. And we want to increase the funding of our state legislature for prevention and cessation of tobacco products 
uh, to $10, $10 million. We only spend $3.5 million uh, on cessation efforts, which may very well be the lowest amount in the entire country. Uh, so we want to we want to get that up. We're going to try for uh, the very modest amount of ten million dollars. We of course would like to have a good deal more than that, uh, but we are also hopefully realistic. Uh, second, I want to discuss an upcoming event in Kentucky, only seventeen weeks away. I know that many of you are probably thinking, well, that's, that's about the time March Madness is going to happen. And in Kentucky, that is a very big deal, usually. Uh, and, of course, you're right. But uh, also around that time, in the spring of 2020, is the decennial U.S. Census. It should be important to each of us. And each of us can help ensure a complete and accurate count of Kentuckians, of the people in our state in 2020. On each of your tables are copies of a map. This information was just released on Wednesday. The blue counties on that map are where 2020 preparations have begun, including a training scheduled with Kentucky's U.S. Census specialists. Counties in gray, 31 out of Kentucky's 120 counties have not begun preparations for the 2020 census. I'm glad to announce here today that the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky will have a request for proposal open soon to support Kentucky communities in their 2020 census preparations. Please join our mailing list to get the announcement. Foundations across the country have been supporting local 2020 census preparations, and I'm glad that the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky will support planning for a complete and accurate count of Kentuckians in 2020. I think we all know why having an accurate and complete account is important uh, for just a, a myriad of reasons. Uh, finally, thank you for joining us today. In this room, we have representation from local and state health departments, community nonprofits, hospitals and clinics, universities, healthcare organizations, and more. We know we must use data to improve health, and that's why we're here today. I'm looking forward to a great day of presentations and discussion. I know that it takes all of us working together to improve the health in our region. And now, I'm glad to introduce to you my collaborator, my colleague, my very longtime friend, and just a great guy, President and Chief Executive Officer of Interact for Health, Dr. Odell Owens. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Good morning. Yes, Ben and I are good friends. I think that's important when you can trust each other. And we have a great relationship between his foundation and our foundation. I have the honor to be the president and CEO of a, of a great organization. But before I speak, I'm just a mouthpiece. The people who really do the work are people who deserve the credit. So will the employees, the staff of Interact for Health and our board members who are here, will you please stand? And could you show them a little love, please? We're very excited to, to put the conference on on data, but let me first give you a, a little snippet about uh, Interact for Health. Interact for Health was formed uh, when, Choice, when Humana, a for-profit uh, insurance company, bought uh, Choice Care, which is a nonprofit physician-owned group. And when, you, when a for-profit buys a nonprofit, those proceeds must go to another nonprofit, and typically people create a foundation. So the Greater Cincinnati Health Foundation was created in, I think, 1999. Uh, the name was changed about five years ago to Interact for Health. Now, that's important to understand that because we operate in 20 counties. The 20 counties that we provide grants in were the same counties that those physicians who were involved in choice care practice in. So that's why we have about eight counties in Kentucky, seven in Ohio, and about three in Indiana. And that's where we limit our grant making based on the legacy. 
We have three main pillars that we work today. We used to be more of a responsive foundation, actually responding to requests for foundations, to go more to become a strategic foundation, really focusing on three pillars that will allow us to go deeper and to put a much more rich grants uh, into the community. Our first pillar is school-based health center, which we've been doing since the start of the uh, foundation. And that's where we have opened up to date about 35, 36 school-based health centers. That is putting health care in the school where the kids are. The whole goal is to make kids healthier. If they're healthier, they can be educated. And hopefully that will help to increase those graduation rates. We have moved from just starting a health center to now we will only open hopefully hubs and the hub consists of dental where we actually have dental chairs in the, in the schools as well as vision. It is a shame that a child was lab labeled as being poor in math because, what they, because they, they add up six and six and they get 12 but the numbers were actually eight and eight. They just couldn't see it correctly and therefore they were performing poorly. So not only do we have the testing and all the equipment, all the glasses are delivered to the school. So the kids stay in school and also more importantly, the parents stay at work. We can monitor these kids. We can make sure they get their immunization and try, we try to aim for 99% uh, immunization rates. And we have seen some great stories and some sad stories. A sad one to me is uh, a child that said for Euler, all I want by the time I graduate is to be able to remove my hand from my mouth when I speak because their teeth were in such bad condition and they were being teased and being bullied. And through the dental services, that child was able to move their hand from their mouth by the time they were a senior. Our second pillar is tobacco. I'm so proud of the work that Megan and her team has done with, with tobacco. And I know when we started talking about tobacco three years ago, there were some people that said, that's, that's not sexy. That's old. Have we solved that problem? No. No. Not in disparate groups. Yes, the, the, the smoking rate nationally is about 14%, but as Ben said in some of his counties, as high as 35%. And in the poor African-American communities, as high as 30% as well. And we also saw in our tobacco survey that Megan led that we looked at how the tobacco companies can market. And we found in our survey of Greater Cincinnati that about 14%, I guess, no, I'm sorry, 19% of whites smoke menthols but 70% of African-Americans smoke menthol. That's not by accident. That's being targeted. Menthols is important because menthols is the easiest cigarette to start with, but it's the hardest one to quit. So when you follow all this dialogue, pay attention on the national level, state level, and city levels, when people, when the tobacco companies say, okay, we'll give up flavors except for menthol. Watch that conversation. Our third pillar is certainly the, the heroin and the opioid epidemic, which is now changing uh, because fentanyl has come into play and fentanyl has been added to everything, including now crack. Uh, what we're preparing and trying to do at, at Interac, uh, led by uh, our team leader, Sonia, is to really prepare for the next drug. I'm realistic to say that we may get the opioids under control, uh, but there'll be another drug that we'll need to be prepared for. At Interac, we put a lot of worth on data, that's what we do. But trusted data, we strive to be your trusted source of information. Data is good, but data must be accurate. And the thing about data for me is that data cannot just be numbers. Data must lead to action. Good data should inspire. Good data should outrage you. And sometimes good data should make you cry. It is sad, I can give you an example, that sometimes you don't need a massive amount of data to understand a situation. I'll give you an example, if you give me the percent of free lunch, of children getting free lunch at a Cincinnati public school, I'll give you a profile of that school on one data point. One data point. I'll tell you about the, the generalization of the academic performance. I'll tell you how many kids there have come from single parents. I'll tell you how many kids have a discipline problem on one data point. So we sometimes don't need, need a lot, but we still, whatever it's a lot or one, we need action. But we need good data to go forward. I want to share with you at your tables, we, we released a variety of surveys, health status. Today, we released the one on Narcan. It's sort of interesting that Narcan just a few years ago was a prescription. You had to have a prescription. Today, you can walk into a pharmacy and buy it. We have distributed probably over $300,000 worth of Narcan because Narcan is that drug that can save lives. And uh, it's sort of interesting that when we started this journey of really distributing Narcan. What, to me, one of the saddest examples is when we trained an 11-year-old girl 
to use Narcan because in Price Hill, because both her parents had overdosed previously. An 11-year-old girl has to be subjected to trying to save her parents. I remember when Narcan, you could give just one dose. You could start out by taking it, putting it in the nose and squeeze it. And about halfway through, people begin to wake up. And you never gave the full dose because when you give people Narcan, you take away their high. And oftentimes, they wake up very angry and begin to fight the first responders. So people should give it very slowly. <laughs> One amp today won't work, two may not work. In fact, they went, the company went from packaging just one at a time to making it a pair. And I've seen people who've needed six or eight because of fentanyl, which is 20 to 30 times more powerful than the heroin. So there's a lot of work still that has to be done. And our study is really just looking at the awareness. Are people aware of Narcan? Who supports it? What's the attitude? Uh, and majority of people, four out of 10 people said they would support carrying Narcan. I carry one in my car and had the opportunity once to, to use it um, at a Dewey's Pizza, outside of Dewey's Pizza on Madison Road in Cincinnati. So it doesn't mean you're going you're gonna to carry because you and not carry because you don't go to a poor neighborhood. That's a very middle class neighborhood, and I used it one day. So again, today, I thank you for, for coming, for joining us. I hope that you will share. But I hope that you, again, I want to emphasize how important data is, but it must be trusted, it must be used, it must be turned into action. I'd now like to call the organizer, one of the co-organizers of this conference who's worked so hard, uh, Colleen from our organization, to lead the rest of the day. Thank you.